at how to calculate the eigenvalues of a finite dimensional uh, matrix. And also we'll talk about the eigenvectors and their properties. Okay? Very good. So as a short recap from the previous session, so we said that let's assume that we have a matrix A, which is square. And the size of A is n by n. Then we have this expression, A multiplied by a vector x, which is the eigenvector of A, is equal to lambda, which is the eigenvalue of A, multiplied by x, which is the, uh, the eigenvector, okay? So as you see, I mean, on both sides, we have this eigenvector. On the left-hand side, we have the matrix vector multiplication. So A is n by n, and x is n by 1. And lambda is a scalar. And then we have x, which is n by 1. So always we have a pair of eigenmodes, which means that we have lambda and associated to that, or corresponding to that, we have x. OK? Then how to kind of calculate the lambda as an x? So we have this main definition here. So we bring the expression on the right-hand side to the left-hand side. And then we have x here as the eigenvector. And inside the parentheses, you see this a minus lambda i. So lambda is a scalar, but we are going to do some matrix um, subtraction here. So we said that these two matrices have to have the same uh, size. So a is n by n, but lambda is a scalar. So we need to multiply lambda by i, which is, the, uh, which is an identity matrix of the same size as a, which is n by n. And we said that in order to get a non-trivial solution for this, which means that we, don't, we are not interested in x equals 0. We know that if we put x equals 0, this, this expression, is, is, this equality is kind of satisfied. But it's a trivial solution. We are looking for non-trivial solutions. And for the non-trivial solutions to exist, we have to have the determinant of this expression within the parentheses to be zero, meaning that this, the whole matrix within the parentheses is not invertible. We cannot find the inverse of that. So given the condition, we came up with this. So this is the main expression that we are going to use in order to calculate the eigenvalues. So now we are going to iterate a bit more about this and see how we can use this expression in practice to calculate the eigenvalues. So here I have summarized the things that we need to do. So we have this A as, uh, as, a, as a square matrix, n by n. As you see, we have elements A11 to A n n. Okay. So this is the definition that we had. A x is equal to lambda x. And we said that this will lead to this expression. So in order to calculate the eigenvalues, we should make sure that the, ter the determinant of this expression, this matrix, doesn't exist. Sorry, the determinant is 0, which, mean, which means that the inverse of this matrix doesn't exist. So always we use this expression here. The determinant of this a minus lambda i has to be 0 in order to calculate the eigenvalues of A. So at most, we can have n eigenvalues here. Or we have exactly n eigenvalues. But some of them, they, I mean, might be multiplicative. So this sign, as we said, this vertical line, is another way of showing the determinant of the matrix. So basically, this expression is being written in this form. So we said that this i is, uh, is the identity matrix, which means that the elements on the main diagonal of i are 1, and the rest of elements are 0. So if we multiply that by lambda and subtract it from a, it's going to affect only the elements on the main diagonal of a. So as you see, on the main diagonal, we have this minus lambda. Okay. And in, uh, I mean, from the previous lectures, we learned how to calculate the determinants of a matrix in the, in the general way. So here we have n by n. 
So we can calculate this, the, the determinant of this and make it, make it equal to zero. Doing that, we are going to come up with the polynomial P of lambda, okay? And the polynomial order is going to be N. So I will talk about it a bit more in the next slide. So these two expressions are the same. Okay, from the determinant, you will get this P of lambda, which is the polynomial of order lambda, uh, order N of lambda, and we make it equal to zero. And we solve this, and we get N eigenvalues. So actually, we are going to find the roots of a polynomial of lambda of order N. So then, when we calculate, the, when we have these eigenvalues here, what we do is that we go back to the main expression, main definition here, or equivalently, this one. So what we do is that we say that, okay, a minus lambda i multiplied by x is equal to zero. So in fact, what we have here has been written in the matrix form, in the expanded form here. So as you see, the size of the vectors are n, I mean this zero vector and the elements of x, which means that each eigenvector is going to have n component, right? And I put this super index, i, which means that we are referring to the eigenvalue correspond, eigenvector corresponding to the i-th eigenvector, uh, eigenvalue, all right? So this expression should hold for all the eigenvalues. That's why that we use i, and we let i to change from one to n. So to summarize, we solve this, uh, determinant equal to zero. We get the roots of this polynomial. We get the, so which are the eigenvalues of the matrix. Then one by one, we should plug them into in this linear system and calculate all n components of the corresponding eigenvector. So this is the whole thing that we are going to work with today. We are going to have some examples and we'll talk about some properties of this. Um, Next lecture, I guess we get into the numerical approaches to compute eigenvalues. But today is just about calculation, which means that the mathematical way, like closed form. So, do you have any question before we move on? Yes, please. So, may I explain what? So this one? Yeah. Okay. So we, we are just using the definition here. Okay. As we said, the determinant of a minus lambda i has to be zero, and this is exactly something that has been written here. So we said that this i has non-zero non-zero members or elements only on its main diagonal. So we just have this minus lambda on the main diagonal of the expression. And we should calculate the eigen, sorry, the determinant of this matrix. Okay? So like determinant of the diagonal? No, determinant of the matrix. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, but, and, and we had ways, you remember those uh, uh, cofactors and uh, minors? We had the definition, I mean, the last lecture. Okay, so we calculate the determinant of this. So lambda is unknown, so we get the polynomial of lambda of order n, then we calculate the eigenvalues from there. Okay, so as we said, if we just make this determinant of this expression equal to zero, I calculate the determinant of this guy here, this is equivalent to get this polynomial of lambda. 
So this is the general expression for the polynomial that we call it characteristic polynomial of a matrix. But in order to get that, I mean, there is no direct way unless we calculate the determinant of A minus lambda I. So there is no formula for this, but we are just showing that, okay, how it looked like. So as you see, the leading order is lambda to the power n, meaning that this polynomial is of order n. So in the first line, is just a direct definition of the polynomial of order n in terms of lambda. But as you see here, we can just uh, factorize lambda 1 to lambda m. So we are using index m here because we are admitting the fact that we, although we have a, an n by n matrix A, we may not have n distinct eigenvalues. We only have m distinct eigenvalues in practice. m is equal or less than n. So, but the fact is that the total number of the eigenvalues is always n. We should get n eigenvalues, but maybe among them only m eigenvalues are distinct, which means that some of them are repeated. So given that, we should, we should, that these superscripts that we have here, ki is showing the multiplicity of, the, uh, of, of, of an eigenvalue. But the important thing is that when we have the set of the distinct eigenvalues, we call it the spectrum of A. So in some cases, we have M equals to N, which means that all the eigenvalues that we get from the matrix are distinct, okay? Then all of them are in the spectrum of A. But in some cases, just M eigenvalues are distinct, which are less than the size of the matrix. So any question? Very good. But there is uh, there's something important here. What happened? <coughs> ah, very good. So when we get eigenvector, which we haven't talked about it, how to get it. I mean, we, we explained kind of the basics, but we will show I mean, the rest of the lecture. So when we find an eigenvector of a matrix, we should know that if we multiply that by a constant C, the resulting vector, which we call it Cx, is again an eigenvalue, eigenvector of A. Okay? If you find one eigenvector, then you have infinite, because you have infinite number of uh, constants by which you can multiply x. And usually, in practice, when we report the eigenvectors, we would like to normalize them. So for normalization, if we have this x, which is an eigenvector, so in general has n components, okay? So we should divide x by the norm of x. So I don't know if you are familiar with it or not, but have you seen norm before, norm of a vector? Okay, anyway, this is the norm. So somehow it's just, uh, it can be magnitude of the vector. But we can have different definitions for the norm, and one has to be very specific what definition is used. Okay, so I have given two ways, or, I mean, two general definitions on how to calculate this norm. One is the LP norm, here, so this p is, uh, is like a positive integer, 1, 2, and so on. So we just find the absolute value of each component of x to the power p, then sum them up, and find the pth uh, root of that expression, I mean the value. So this is like, uh, so if you, for instance, look at the L2 norm, this is written as square root of x12 plus x22 plus all the members 
plus xn squared. Okay? So I guess you have seen this. So if you just imagine, I mean, that we have a vector in the three-dimensional space, so this norm, L2 norm, is just the magnitude of the vector. And we are already familiar with it. This is norm. This is something that is called norm. Because magnitudes are usually shown with one. Magnitude. Yeah, but, but it can, yeah, exactly. But we have different measures to calculate the, 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 the magnitude of a, kind of a vector. This comes from some fundamental mathematical concept. Okay. And if we say infinity norm, which means that we should just find the maximum value of the, the maximum of the absolute values of these components x1 to xn. Okay? So it's, and in any case, this norm is just a scalar, it's just one value. Okay? But it's kind of, uh, we usually do that, this normalization. We don't have to, but most of the time it's like a standard thing. Perfect. So let's look at an example. So it's just the extension of the example that you have it in the slides. And by the way, I will upload this after the lecture. So we have this. Uh, a, which is a 3 by 3 matrix, is a real matrix, meaning that all the elements of A are real. Okay? And we want to calculate the eigenvalues of A. So as we said, we just have one definition from which we should start. So this is the definition. The term of A minus lambda I has to be 0. And this vertical line is a determinant. So what you do in practice, you just put your matrix and subtract lambda from all elements on the main diagonal, as you see here, and make it zero. So in the previous lecture, we learned how to calculate the determinant of a three by three matrix. So I leave it as a homework for you. But the easiest way would be just expanding around the first column because we have one zero, which means that we just we need to do two calculations. So around the first element, we just expand minus one to the power one plus one, first element, which means that the first column, first row, and then we have this minus one. So as I said, I'm not going to explain it because I mean just for the sake of time. But anyway, is then we get two two by two matrices, um, and we have to compute the to calculate the, the, the determinant. So if we do that, we end up with this expression. So you do not need to expand here in this special case. You just multiply this by here and then by this, and you will see that the expressions, I mean, the remaining ones, will be cancelled out. And what you will get in the end is this third order polynomial, which I didn't expand. But this is exactly in the form of this characteristic polynomial, saying that, okay, we expected to get exactly three eigenvalues as we get here, because we have a polynomial of order three of lambda. But as we see, the multiplicity of the eigenvalues, or all of them, is one, which means that we have three distinct eigenvalues. And it's clear what they are. It's lambda 1 minus 1, lambda 2 is 1, and lambda 3 is 2. As we said, we have to, we have to plug this in in the definition again to calculate the eigenvectors, but this, is, this requires to be able to solve linear systems, but we are going to discuss these linear systems next week, so I'm going to postpone it for now, but you will learn how to calculate the eigenvectors there. I 
good. Is it clear what we are doing? Perfect. <clears throat> now let's look at another example. So we can have complex eigenvalues even though we have a real kind of uh, real matrix. So as an example, we have a two by two matrix C and all elements are real. But let's do the same thing, the same procedure to calculate the eigenvalues of C. So just subtract the main diagonal elements, I mean subtract lambda from them. So the, the determinant of this is lambda square minus minus one, this lambda square plus one is zero. Just put it on the other side and we know that both eigenvalues are going to be plus minus i. Okay, they are pure imaginary. As we expected, they are conjugate pairs. So if you have complex eigenvalues, you always have them in pair. So you cannot have like plus i and the other one to be real. Okay, if you have one, definitely you have the pair of that conjugate pair of that. So, okay, so we get complex eigenvalues from real matrix. So in this case, since it's a simple one, I'm going to show the procedure on how to calculate the eigenvectors. So we have two eigenvalues, so one by one, we have to plug them in in this definition of i minus lambda i equals zero. Okay, this is vector zero, it's two-dimensional. Okay, so I'm going to plug lambda one, which is minus i. So minus minus i, if I plug this minus i instead of lambda. So it's plus i on the main diagonal. Then, sorry, I have this x here. Vector x, which has to have two elements because we have a two by two matrix. So this super index, it shows that we, have, we are talking about the first eigenvector, which is corresponding to the first eigenvalue that we have taken it to be minus i. And this has to be zero, okay? So here I have a matrix vector multiplication. So it's a two by two matrix, and this guy is two by one, so the resulting vector is two by one, which is correct, because on the other side, we also have a two by one matrix, which is a vector. So if I do that, the first element multiplied by this x1 and minus one by x2, so this is one equation, and the second equation is just obtained from the second row multiplied by the column of x1, x2. So here we have two unknowns. We exactly have two equations. So the system is determined. So we can calculate x1 and x2. So <clears throat> here we can guess what, the, what we should plug here. If you put x2 to be i, then you will see that x1 has to be one, okay? So, okay, there, there's a typo here. I mean, this has to be divided by square root of two because we are doing the normalization here. We have the vector of one, one i, so if you just normalize it, it has to be divided by a square root of two. And we are using L2 norm. So the same thing happens if you plug in the second eigenvalue. And if you look at the eigenvectors, it's very interesting to see that. We have uh, these two eigenvectors as conjugate pairs. So the conclusion is that when we have conjugate pairs of eigenvalues for a matrix, their corresponding eigenvectors are also conjugate pairs. So if you get this one, you don't need to calculate the other eigenvector, just make a conjugate of that. And for conjugate, you just keep the real part as it is, 
and change the sign of the imaginary part. So one is the same, but the imaginary part was one, here is minus one. So this, this over line here also shows the conjugate or complex conjugate. Okay, now we are going to move on to some basic definitions about the vector spaces. So imagine that we have this V as X plus and dot product. So this X is a set of vectors. So this plus sign is just the addition of the vectors which belong to the set X. And this dot is just the scalar vector multiplication. And what we call this B to B is a vector space. Okay, so we have a set of vectors which together form a space. For form a space. Okay. But now the question is that what are the bases of that space? So th these concepts are a bit kind of very basic, but I, I will give you an example to understand what we are talking about. Now, consider that we have a VB, which is another space, and this space happens to be the subspace of V. Sorry, but this, I mean, I, I need to explain this. Then this VB is going to have a set of K vectors. So the members of VB form basis for V if for any vector that we have in space V we can write which means that any vector that we pick up from a space V can be written as a linear combination of the vectors from space VB. So, okay, this is a basic kind of definition. It's a general definition. To grasp the idea is enough to look at the three-dimensional space. So it's X, Y, Z, right? Okay, then we have unit vector i in x direction, j, and k. So this i is going to be 1, 0, 0, j is 0, 1, 0, and k is 0, 0, 1, right? So these form bases. for any x that is coming from the three-dimensional space. So any vector that we have in the 3D space, okay, can be written as a linear combination of i, j, and k. It's kind of something that we know. 
So NEX can be written as C1I plus C2J plus C3K. And definitely we can extend this to n dimensional space. So of course we cannot represent it here on the paper. We have only the three dimensional the maximum for, for visualization. But you can think about it that we have n dimensional space, but things work in the same way. We have a set of bases which can, by which we can express any vector in the corresponding space. I said this, I mean, as, a, as, a, as an introduction to one important concept that is linear independence of the eigenvectors. So in general, for a set of vectors, if we have them, the, so if we have vectors, we are, I'm not talking particularly about the eigenvectors, but what I'm going to say is applicable to the eigenvectors as well, because I, eigenvectors are vectors in the end. So imagine that we have a set of vectors that we are going to show them by x1. So I put underline, which means that these are vectors, x2 and x, k. So these are linearly independent if, if we have a linear combination of them So this linear combination equals to zero holds only if we had all this multiplication, this constant c1 to ck to be zero. This is the only way for the vectors to be linearly independent. So if you have as k vectors, and if you want to check if they are linearly independent or not, you just, you should write this expression, the one here. Okay? And then you should show that this doesn't hold unless we have C1, C2, to CK equal to zero. This is the only way. Which, I mean, another interpretation of this is that none of these vectors in this set can be expressed in terms of the linear combination of the other vectors. And this is like the meaning of the independence. Okay? So as we said, these are applicable to the eigenvectors of a matrix. But as a rule of thumb, let's say that we have this A as an n, n by n matrix. Okay? And we calculate the eigenvalues of A and corresponding eigenvectors. So we have two situations. Case one, if all n eigenvalues are distinct. Okay? We do not have any of them as a repeated value. 
we have n dimensionals, I mean n by n matrix, we have n eigenvalues, and all n eigenvalues are distinct. So if we have this condition, then the corresponding eigenvectors are linearly independent. Okay? So when they are linearly independent, they can be used as basis for a dimensional space. This is the basic definition that we have. Therefore, they form basis for Rn, like n-dimensional space, which I assume them. I mean, to, I mean, each dimension we have only the real numbers, so it's R superscript n. So if you have a three by three matrix, okay. And if we have all eigenvalues, all the three eigenvalues distinct, then we have three eigenvectors, and these three eigenvectors form basis for any vector in the three-dimensional space, R3. But what happens if we have some of the eigenvalues to be a kind of I mean, repetitive. Well, what happens? If only m, where m is less than n, eigenvalues are distinct. What happens? Then only the eigenvectors corresponding to those m distinct eigenvalues are linearly independent. Right? So we have two cases. If we have n eigenvalues that are distinct, all the eigenvectors associated to them are linearly independent. But if we only have m of those n eigenvalues distinct, then only m eigenvectors which are corresponding to those distinct eigenvalues are linearly independent. I mean, no, nothing really kind of complicated. So in this case, We say matrix A is defective. Okay? So if you look at the slides uh, of the course, you will see that you have uh, def defective matrices. So unfortunately, for the sake of time, I need to skip that. I can show you where you should look at. Okay, you see the slide? Defective matrices. So if we have only m of n eigenvalues as, uh, as, I mean, to be distinct, then we cannot have a complete set of eigenvectors which are linearly independent. Perfect. So. Let's look at an example. I guess now it's time for, for an example. Uh, so it's kind of extensive. I have shown all the details, so later that I will upload this, you can go through them. 
by trying to explain it here as well. So what we have is that we have, we have been given this matrix A, which is 3 by 3, and A is real. And if you remember, this, this matrix is called upper triangular. Why? Because only the main diagonal and elements above that are non-zero. And all elements below the main diagonal are zero. So it's upper triangular. It's like a triangle. So what we want to do is that we want to calculate the eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors and also check if the eigenvectors are linearly independent or not. So again, we start from the basic definition that we had. So always start from here. Then we say that, okay, determinants of A minus lambda I has to be zero. So if you look at the slides from the previous session, you see that this is upper triangular matrix, and for that we can calculate this eigenvalues in a very easy way, because only when you calculate the determinant here, only the elements in the, on the main diagonal are going to contribute in the determinant. So already it's clear from here that we have three distinct eigenvalues. So can you tell me quickly about the eigenvectors linear, in, linear independence? Do you think they are independent or not? We just had this, those two cases. So based on that. Yeah? Exactly. So this is case one. We have a 3 by 3 matrix, which means that we have three eigenvalues, and it happens that all the eigenvalues are distinct. So the three eigenvectors corresponding to these eigenvalues are linearly independent. And we want to show that here, OK? Because we would like to kind of understand all the details and the steps. So here we have calculated the eigenvalues. And if you remember, the first or the second slide that we saw today was about the linear system from which we can calculate the components of the eigenvectors. So basically, this guy is written here. But since we have three eigenvalues, we put index i and we let i to change from 1 to 3, which means that for each of these lambdas, we have to solve a linear system of size 3. So in each case, we are going to find the three components of the corresponding eigenvector. Okay, so I have this main expression, and what I'm going to do is that plug one by one these three eigenvalues. So I use lambda one equal to one, so I put it inside of this lambda I here. Okay, so this makes the first column zero. I just calculate this. And now let's do the matrix vector multiplication to just write down the, our linear system, which is a combination of three uh, algebraic equations here. So each row of this matrix is multiplied by all elements on the, uh, of the vector. So OK, when, if you look at the third equation, you get already the value of x3. OK? Can you scroll down, please? Oh, sorry. Maybe I do not need that, OK? So from here, we get x3. The third component of the first eigenvector is 0. So if I plug this in the second one, I get the second component of the first eigenvector also 0. OK? But, as you see, x, the first component, x1, doesn't appear in any of these equations, which means that it, I mean, it has an arbitrary value. But that arbitrary value cannot be 0, because we said that if it becomes 0 and the other two components are also 0, then we get a trivial solution. But if you remember at the first point, we said that we are not interested in the trivial solution of x equals 0. 
okay, so I just assign value one to it, okay? So then I get my first eigenvector, and this is corresponding to this lambda one. Wait, sir. Does the arbitrary value have to be one? It can be anything. I just put one for simplicity. Exactly, it has to be non-zero. Because if it's zero, then the whole x becomes zero. I mean, we, we haven't done anything. So, any question about this? But okay, you see, I mean, this is a bit kind of a nice matrix, it's upper triangular, so I'm just doing this kind of linear, the solution of this linear system kind of in a nice way, but it may happen that you need to use kind of a, more general approach for solving this, and don't worry about it, you will learn it next week. This is the solution of a linear system, and you will learn it later. Okay, it was the first eigenvalue, and now I go to the second one. And I do exactly the same thing. So two, so I substitute lambda by two, then I get this. So this time I get a different linear system to solve. So here I have three unknowns and only two equations. But I have an expression, I mean, uh, a, con a relation between x2 and x3. So I can substitute this in the first one. But as I said, it's under determined system. We have three unknowns, two equations, so we have to assume one value for one of these components. So I assume x1 to be one, and I can calculate the x2 and x3 values. But be careful, in this case, I didn't normalize the vector. And I will go to the third eigenvalue, and the same story. So I will calculate the third eigenvector. And now we come to, the, to this problem. Do we have linear independence, uh, linear, linearly independent eigenvectors or not? So as we said, in order to check this, what we do, we start from this. We have three eigenvectors, so we write the linear combination of this three. So C1 multiplied by X1 plus C2, X2 plus C3, X3, and make it zero. And we say that if this holds only if C1, C2, and C3 are zero at the same time, then we can say that these eigenvectors are linearly independent, meaning that none of them can be expressed in terms of the other two. All right? So I do that, so this is, this bold face are vector, so I have a linear system of size three here. So I just do the scalar vector multiplication, sum them up, and clearly I start from the bottom, C2 is zero, substitute it in the second one, you get C3 zero, and then C10, and this is exactly what we were looking for, that these three constants are zero at the same time. So the x1, x2, x3 are linearly independent. And I mean, if you are asked to check the linear independence of the a set of matrices, you should just do the same thing. And you will learn how to solve this, I mean, linear system later, okay. So if you don't mind, may I have one more minute? Sure. Okay, thanks. Then I can I mean, finish at the good point. So we have a very special matrix here. I mean, it has all the good properties in the world. The good property one is that it's a square, of course. It's n by n. The second one, it is real. All elements of A are real. Okay? So it's a square, it is real, and it is symmetric. Do you remember what was the definition of Symmetric? A symmetric matrix is one with transposed to the original. 
Exactly. So if, yeah, if we calculate the transpose of A, it is exactly the same as original matrix A. So if we have these properties, then the eigenvectors are mutually orthogonal, which means that if you pick any pair, any two of these eigenvectors, and calculate the inner product of them, it will be zero. So for any peak of the, any peak of two vectors from, from, from the set of eigenvectors. So this is inner product. But in addition to this, if we also have the eigenvalues to be positive, all of them, then matrix A is called symmetric positive definite. And later in many applications in, for instance, dynamical systems, vibrations, numerical analysis, control theory, you will see that we are very much interested in this type of matrices because of all the good properties they have. But, I mean, I, we are not going to talk about this more, but it's very important to know about this. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. I would like to thank you all for today. And I'm here, I mean, if you have any questions. Thank you.